My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. The Diamond Nine is probably the most famous maneuver the Red Arrows display. It's a move that's thrilled crowds all over the world for more than 30 years. But these displays are more than just entertainment. They present a dazzling shop window for British industry, coaxing export orders from around the world. They inspire the men and women who serve in the RAF and command the respect and support of the taxpayers who ultimately foot the bill. For 80 years, such performances have helped the RAF keep its independence, because during its entire existence, it has been under attack from forces at the very heart of power in Britain. On the 11th of November 1918, the guns on the Western Front fell silent. The slaughter of World War I had finally come to an end. The RAF, which had only been formed eight months earlier, was now the largest air force in the world. By 1919, only ten years after Blériot flew across the English Channel, the RAF had aircraft like the Vickers Vimy capable of flying a thousand miles. It was built to reach and bomb Berlin from Britain with 2,500 pounds of bombs. Yet, it was smaller than the bombers it replaced. However, the war's end meant that it never showed its destructive potential. The war to end all wars had been costly, and over the next few years, the Royal Air Force found itself undermined by lack of investment. Politicians believed that the RAF had been created solely to help win the war and that the end of the conflict would signal the end of this independent service. RAF commanders expected some reduction in wartime strengths, but in just two years it was reduced from 399 squadrons to just 41, and personnel was cut by 90%. The demise of the RAF seemed certain. However, the increasing popularity of public air displays allowed the RAF to demonstrate that taxpayers' money was being well spent. Well, it's no doubt that uh, there was a fair amount of goodwill towards the, uh, the Air Force at the time. But I think there was also a fear that unless something was done to help the Royal Air Force, then if a bomber came to attack the United Kingdom, then we would find ourselves virtually defenseless. So there was this desire not only to uh, help the, the Air Force in its infancy, but there was also a desire to get better protection. Because I think people at the time had come to the conclusion that the, the mire, the slaughter, the deaths of World War I, the futility, if you like, of trench warfare, meant that something, there must have been a better way uh, of actually prosecuting a war. And from that, of course, the Royal Air Force had found its raison d'etre in the means by which it used bombers to go and attack enemy countries. Airmen themselves were still knights of the air, basking in the glory of the aces of the RFC. Flying aircraft covered in bright silver dope, they dazzled the crowds who gathered to watch. In the face of government antipathy, RAF Supremo Air Marshal Sir Hugh Trenchard quickly realized the value of this publicity and he encouraged squadrons to form their own display teams. Each year, a different squadron was nominated as the official RAF team. The first Hendon Air display took place in 1920, in front of more than 60,000 people who came to watch formation flying and aerobatic feats performed in the very same aircraft that had helped win the war. The Hendon Air Show quickly became established as part of the summer social season, 
which meant there were many in the crowd who were not without influence. For the RAF, formation flying was a great way to perfect pilot skills, as it meant that pilots had to practice it regularly. Many of the maneuvers were based on air-to-air -air combat techniques developed during the First World War. Thus it was believed that the ability to fly in unison and harmony would pay immense dividends if war ever returned. Manufacturers were also keen to feed off the public enthusiasm and for them a new types park was created to show off their latest aircraft. The people adored it all. The public was also greatly impressed by some of the record-breaking flights that were now being attempted in aircraft types flown by the RAF. Flying to some extent was in its infancy. We had the largest empire in the world with South Africa, New Zealand and Australia and all these places spread around. And I think uh, uh, there was great anxiety to get the lines of communication as quick and as short as we could. And I think anyone that could get to, shall we say, Australia, or Sydney or get to Cape Town in uh, a record time was worthy of acclaim. And then, of course, also the mystique that uh, was attached to aircraft by the people that didn't fly. It was something that was so new and so, uh, you know, exciting and so romantic. The publicity generated by the success of such adventures was invaluable in establishing the importance of aviation and, by association, that of the RAF itself. In June 1919, two former RAF aircrew, John Alcock and Arthur Witten Brown, flying a Vimy, achieved what had seemed to be impossible. They bridged the Atlantic by air. Then, in November of that year, two brothers, Ross and Keith Smith, took off in a Vimy from Hounslow near London at the start of the longest flight the world had ever seen. They flew over 11,000 miles in under 28 days before landing in Darwin, Australia. Not only had they set a new record, they also won a £10,000 prize put up by the Australian government. These long-range flights showed that bombers could fly further than anyone had imagined. This Vimy was built to recreate the Ross's epic flight. Variants of the Vimy would remain in service right up until the mid-1930s. To be the best, or the fastest, or the highest, has always been the goal of pilots and manufacturers alike. As soon as a record was set, it had to be beaten. The pilots became the superstars of their day. London to Cairo, London to Cape Town, Cairo to the Cape. All these routes and more were pioneered in the 20s, often by military aircraft, and were soon in regular use by civilian airlines. The red, white and blue was flying on more than flags around the world. In the 30s, even as the clouds of war were rolling in across Europe, aviation records were still being broken. Three Vickers Wellesleys, flown by RAF pilots, set the long-distance record in 1938 by flying non-stop from Cairo to Australia, over 7,000 miles in 48 hours. These were the first aircraft to be built with a tough and durable lattice frame designed by Barnes Wallace. Long-distance flights like these did more than just raise the profile of the RAF. They also forced military strategists to think long and hard about the use of air power in future conflicts. And the bomber 
was central to their ideas. Well, you have to realize that in the aftermath of World War I, there was a belief that there must be a better way of prosecuting a war. The slaughter of the First World War and the trench warfare and the futility of all that made people think, surely there is a better way. Now, the better way seemed to lie in the opportunities offered by a bombing force. Don't forget, of course, that Britain suffered very heavily in 1915 and 1917 from German air raids. And the belief, therefore, was that a bomber could be used to attack strategic and critical targets that would take an enemy out of the war. Plus, there was, of course, the romance, as I alluded earlier, uh, of the aircraft itself. Now, why was it we didn't buy a fighter force in the first instance? Well, that was largely predicated on, upon the view that the space, the aerospace, is such a vast area, and you have vagaries of cloud and light, that to find a bomber force as it comes to attack a target is going to be almost impossible. And that was certainly the experience of fighter pilots uh, in, the, in, in the 1920s and 30s. Finding an enemy force was going to be very, very difficult. And therefore, it was going to be impossible, therefore, to stop an enemy bomber force from attacking your critical targets. And that's what gave rise to Prime Minister Baldwin's bon mot, the bomber will always get through. And so the idea was that if you are going to fight the enemy, there is no point in building up a large fighter force because that would be wasted. It won't be able to attack the bombers because it won't be able to find them. If you want to fight an enemy, you bomb them more quickly than they can bomb you. And by that means, you take them out of the war first. Trenchard had become an ardent believer in the ability of the bomber to win wars, a belief reinforced by the writing of the Italian theorist, General Giulio Douai. Douai foresaw how, in future conflicts, aircraft could go far behind the fortified lines of defense without breaking through them. The battlefield will be limited only by the boundaries of the nations at war, and all of their citizens will become combatants, since all of them will be exposed to the aerial offensives of the enemy. There will be no distinction any longer between soldiers and civilians. With the bitter experiences of the First World War on the forefront of his mind, Trenchard warned to Douay's theories. The first sea lord, Admiral Beatty, wasn't so easily convinced. Trenchard's response was uncompromising. It is on the bomber that we must rely for defence. It is on the destruction of enemy industries and, above all, on the lowering of morale caused by bombing that ultimate victory rests. Beatty had good reason to be wary of air power. General Billy Mitchell had already bombed and sunk a captured German battleship to show that air power was inevitably challenging the role of the Navy as the defender of a nation's strategic interests. Arguably, the dreadnought was something that was too powerful, too expensive, and too valuable to lose. And indeed, when the aircraft uh, started to be used to attack ships for the first time, as was demonstrated by the Americans uh, in the attacks on the Ostfriesland, it became clear that the heavy battleships' days were numbered, because an aircraft now could sink a ship which, of course, was unthinkable in the, in the times before aircraft arrived. Trenchard's faith in the bomber was to be upheld by his successors into the 30s, so much so that the RAF's light bomber of the mid-30s, the Hawker Hind, actually flew faster than the fighters of the day. But, of course, aircraft were only part of the story. As Trenchard knew only too well, an air force needs highly skilled people to run it. In creating its own training systems, the RAF inevitably developed its own traditions and infrastructure as an independent air service. Trenchard correctly surmised that the more strongly it became established, the harder it would be to disband. Cranwell, originally a training base for the Royal Naval Air Service, became the site for a new RAF cadet college. School leavers, university graduates, and junior officers transferred from the other services were taught both academic and practical subjects, plus an element of basic flying training. Halton Park was where engineering apprentices were trained. And we could both of us together. And it did seem strange, but the they said, one period, now you 400, you're special lads, you've gone on to special work. That's what you've been enlisted for. Only you, these lot that are coming in now, they're going over to that camp over there, and they're going to follow you a lot. 
But you, what we want, you're the important one. And he said, they've got a name for you here, you know. What's here? And it's trouble to come. He said, you want to be proud of this? He said, you know, you are the original Trenchard Bratz. The original Trenchard Bratz. You're 400. An RAF staff college was set up at Andover, later to move to Bracknell. By 1922, these three institutions were up and running, providing a regular flow of well-trained officers, riggers, fitters, and all the other trades that were essential to the smooth running of the service. Trenchard was a creative and enthusiastic leader. He introduced short service commissions so that there would be a pool of trained pilots in civilian life who could be called up in the event of war. To extend their continued association with the RAF, he created special reserve squadrons. And the Auxiliary Air Force was formed to give weekend flyers a taste of the service. Despite lack of money and aging aircraft, there was one area where Trenchard would not compromise. He made sure that his pilot's flying training was the best. In order to ensure pilots got the best training possible, the Central Flying School was established. Much of their training was on the Avro 504, which was commissioned by the Admiralty and first flew in 1913. Many variants were then produced, which meant that the 504 saw service as a reconnaissance and light bomber plane, as well as being used for home defense during the First World War. This 504K version entered service in 1917 as a basic flight trainer. Its mild flying manners made it the ideal trainer, giving many pilots their first taste of flight. It was fitted with dual controls and trainees were given 30 hours of instruction before moving on to more advanced aircraft. The Central Flying School also trained the instructors, encouraging them to explore the limits of their aircraft so that they would be able to correct their pupils' mistakes with minimal risk. Longevity of the 504 was due in part to a specially designed engine mounting which enabled it to carry any rotary engine in production at the time. It was a time of deep recession in British industry and so to keep aviation manufacturers in business Trenchard tried whenever possible to drip feed them with small orders and modifications to existing aircraft. It was enough, just, to keep the British aircraft industry alive. However, potentially fatal cuts in the RAF's budget could not be avoided solely through flying demonstrations. Practical examples of the RAF's effectiveness were required, and the Empire provided the opportunity needed. Air units had been operating in the far-flung corners of the Empire since 1915. But after the war, the potential for the RAF to undertake policing duties at a fraction of the cost of maintaining military garrisons became obvious. Well, the cost of, uh, of the Royal Air Force was, of course, one of the things that was going to be scrutinised very, very heavily in the aftermath of World War I, particularly when the army, of course, had great uh, policing responsibilities in India. There was a certain measure of unrest uh, bubbling up in India during this period. And it was going to be clear that the Air Force had to compete for its resources. Now, one of the things, one of the opportunities that presented itself at the time was to uh, do a form of imperial policing using aircraft for the first time in some of the colonies. So much so that in Iraq in the 1920s, the Air Ministry actually took over Iraq and using aircraft for the first time saved the defense budget a vast amount of money because the imperial policing was done for a fraction of the equivalent cost of putting an army into the field. In December 1919, Trenchard wrote 
It is perhaps not too much to hope that before long it will prove possible to regard the Royal Air Force units not as an addition to the military garrison, but as a substitute for it. After one such rebellion in British Somaliland, Leopold Amory, the colonial secretary, said, All was over in three weeks. The total cost worked out at £77,000, the cheapest war in history. Time and again, the RAF would demonstrate the potency of air power, quelling tribal insurrections by flying over deserts and mountain ranges, terrain that would have taken many weeks for the army to cross on foot. At the Cairo conference in March of 1921, Trenchard's confidence in the RAF received official support. It was given the lion's share of the defense of the Middle East territories, although India stayed under the army's command. Flying over the northwest frontier was primarily a peacekeeping task. The, the, the Wazirs and the Patans are very tough fighting men who farm. They love fighting. And they used to go down and beat up the local towns and occasionally shoot a political agent and things of that sort. And the Indian government of the time, the British controlled admittedly, wanted to keep the peace up there, so they would, they had two ways of doing it. Either to send the army in along the valleys to uh, enforce some form of, let's call it discipline, organize good manners uh, on the tribesmen, or alternatively the air force could sit over the top of the areas of the tribe which was causing the problem and to prevent them doing the farming, which touched their pockets. The conduct of the air war in the Middle East and India was far removed from the reality of a major conflict. There were no factories or transportation lines to attack, just villages, crops and livestock. An aircraft always dropped leaflets to warn villagers of a forthcoming attack. It was no life of luxury for the RAF pilots and ground crew. The terrain was desert or mountain. The nights were freezing. The daytime temperatures as high as 50 degrees centigrade. Sandstorms and snow both made servicing difficult. Conditions were hard. It was hotter than hell, really. As I said, you couldn't possibly expect anybody to work on a, an aircraft in the open air um, after about nine in the morning, I suppose nine or ten. Um, we used to get rain once or twice, but very rarely did we get any rain at all. It was very dry, very dry. And we used to get the odd sandstorm. You know, I know, I remember for entertainment we poured some engine oil on various bits of the, the ground all around the camp and called those our greens or our browns as you wish, and we played little games of golf, but um, it was it was primitive. Flying out there in the spring was absolutely incredible and wonderful. The, the air was gin clear and you could see two or three hundred miles from very high up. You could see the mountain tops two or three hundred miles away. I loved it. Then and in the summer it got very hot indeed, about 110, and you sweated like a bull in the aeroplane. Got out and you were sort of your shirts and your trousers, your shorts were sodden, and you got pretty tired because you couldn't sleep properly at temp temperature. I remember once when it dropped to 102 once in three weeks, but it was about 110, 115 during the day. For a young squadron leader called Arthur Harris, who would later lead Bomber Command, the conditions left an indelible impression. It was not unknown for aircraft to take off on operations with naked rims because there were no tires and with axles lashed on with doubtful country-made rope because there was no rubber shock absorber rope. We flew on single ignition engines which the Air Force at home had long discarded as unairworthy. It was no joke. Finally, in the late 20s, 
units started to receive replacements for their worn-out aircraft. First to arrive was the Westland Wapiti. Using many of the components of the DH-9, the Wapiti soon became one of the most ubiquitous aircraft flown by the RAF in the interwar period. Stable and strong, the Wapiti had an all-round better performance than the aircraft it was replacing. Marvellous aircraft, really was. I mean, we used to bash it around quite a bit, really. And, but, uh, no, I think the Wapiti was fir first-class aircraft, certainly for the role in which it was employed. The next to arrive was the Hawker Hart, the first of a long line of grace aircraft that would encompass almost every role required of the RAF. Designed by Sidney Cab, the Hart was a day bomber that was even faster than the RAF's own fighters. Trenchard, now acknowledged as the father of the RAF, retired on the 1st of January 1930, after more than 10 years of fighting for the future of the service. He had fought his battles in government and in the furthest reaches of the empire, and he had won. He had created an ethos for his service, and now it was at the forefront of military thinking for the future. Although the need for the RAF to police the empire guaranteed its survival, the limitations of this role had not demanded advanced technology. We were very happy flying out there because it was interesting and you felt you were doing something useful and we were the only people doing anything useful anywhere in the Air Force. Productive, really useful work for the world at large. So we didn't really worry about whether we were getting better aircraft. We didn't need better aircraft. Better aircraft wouldn't do the job any better. The Hind was the last of the great line of Hawker biplanes. Beautiful to look at, as had been its predecessors, the Hart, Fury, Demon and Audax. The Hind achieved the distinction of being the most prolific peacetime aircraft ever used by the RAF. In operational use for only three years, the Hind became the standard trainer for bomber crews. As late as 1937, the Gloucester Gladiator entered service as a fighter. Although it had an enclosed cockpit and four machine guns, it still had a fixed undercarriage and above all, it was a biplane. A stopgap it may have been, but the Gladiator would find a place in the annals of the RAF, not only as its last biplane fighter, but also as an aircraft which against the odds was responsible for shooting down over 250 enemy aircraft in the first years of the Second World War. In spite of a lack of orders from the RAF, one particular designer was pushing the boundaries of airspeed through the development of an aircraft intended not to win wars, but to win an air race. Air racing had become big box office, and international competitions offered impressive prizes and the possibilities of commercial success. The most coveted award was the Schneider Trophy. Three victories in succession won the trophy outright. I was really very young, I was six years old, um, and it was a long way from home. Home was in Devonshire, and we came up to Gosport in our open tour. Um, it was a totally different world in those days. I wasn't quite sure what we were going to see. Uh, so until I got there, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to see, um, but I was happy to see that um, we were camped out on South Sea Beach, near the pier, South Parade Pier, uh, but not only, uh, uh, only my family, there were thousands of people there. The beach was black with people who had come from all over southern England to see this event. It was a beautiful day, I remember. Uh, and of course, it, there was a tremendous um, air of festivity. There were Punch and Judy shows, there were all sorts of things, ice cream men and so on. So it was a great gala day, and we still didn't know what we were going to see. 
Um, just off the end of South Parade Pier was a destroyer of the Royal Navy, and it had a pylon of black and white on it, and it was one of the turning points. And in the days long before public address systems, the thing I remember was how the news of the aircraft's takeoff, some distance away, came along the beach like a, do they call it a Mexican wave, or exactly like that. It just came along hand to, uh, mouth to mouth. They're, they're off, you know, that sort of thing. And before long, these incredible aircraft snarled around this, this uh, beacon op opposite us, this turning point. And uh, really, my, my, I shall never forget the day. Supermarine was a small manufacturer of seaplanes based near Southampton. In 1922, the company entered the Sea Lion II and won the race, achieving a speed of over 120 miles per hour. In 1927, Supermarine entered a new monoplane design, the first of the S-series seaplanes from the work of their chief designer, R.J. Mitchell. Britain won that year and again in 1929. In 1931, the team flying the S-6B was successful for a third time in a row. On the same day, another S-6B set the absolute speed record of just over 379 miles per hour. RAF commanders were shattered to realize that a privately built aircraft could fly 170 miles per hour faster than a Hawker Fury, their latest and fastest operational aircraft. The Schneider Trophy success inspired Mitchell to enter a design for an Air Ministry specification for a new monoplane fighter. The official prejudice that had reigned against small, high-performance monoplanes had been crushed by supermarine success. It was not a moment too soon. By 1934, it was slowly dawning on the government that something needed to be done about air defences. As Winston Churchill put it, we are vulnerable as we've never been before. This cursed, hellish invention and development of war from the air has revolutionized our position. We're not the same kind of country we used to be when we were an island only 20 years ago. This was not overstating the case. In the early years of the century, the position of the Royal Navy was unassailable. It had been instrumental in building and preserving the British Empire. Yet now the country was at risk from attack from the air. In fact, all the fighting services were seriously underfunded and under-equipped. The reason for this went back to 1919, when the Treasury had instituted the 10-year rule. This restricted expenditure on military matters for 10 years on the assumption that it would take at least 10 years for an aggressor to build up sufficient forces to be a threat. There would therefore be plenty of time to re-equip. Unfortunately, this optimistic rule was extended year by year until by 1932, obsolete biplane designs like this Handley Page Hayford bomber with open cockpits and fixed undercarriages was still providing the backbone of the RAF. Sir John Salmond had taken over from Hugh Trenchard as Chief of Air Staff in 1930. It was a time of great economic depression. There were calls for disarmament and even suggestions that bombing should be banned altogether. What's more, the great proportion of Salmon squadrons was stationed overseas, leaving him little or no scope for the improvement of British air defences. Events unfolding in Europe finally made this vulnerability apparent. By the mid-30s, both Germany and Italy had turned to fascism under the dictatorships of Hitler and Mussolini. Ominously, Nazi Germany began rebuilding her armed forces in flagrant breach of the Versailles Treaty. Europe was moving towards war. Britain's initial response was to instigate a program that would expand its military capabilities, including the development of new bomber types in the vain hope of deterring Germany's increasingly obvious ambition. 
three manufacturers successfully tendered their bomber designs. Armstrong Whitworth were to produce the Whitley, Handley Page, the Hamden, but the best known and the aircraft that was to give the longest service of the three was the Vickers Wellington. Over 11,000 of these were to be built. The aircraft was based on Barnes Wallace's geodetic design first tried in the Wellesley. It was to prove extremely resilient to the ravages of anti-aircraft fire. Hundreds were to return from bombing raids with half their fuselage ripped to shreds. But even before these aircraft had been delivered, Britain's priorities had changed. Throughout the 1930s, Hitler bullied his way across Europe. The Rhineland, Austria and Czechoslovakia had all fallen under the Nazi jackboot. He had introduced new aircraft types into the Luftwaffe, which were being proudly displayed before an increasingly nervous world. The issue of Britain's air defence was finally addressed by the government. Sir Thomas Inskip in 1937 reported that more fighters should be built and more importantly should have priority over the bombers. Well, it reflected one of the plans that the Air Ministry uh, had put forward. The Air Ministry had been invited to put a number of plans forward for the build-up of forces in advance of World War II, the World War that was inevitably going to come. And one of these foresaw the build-up of a balanced air force, a large number of bombers, but also a sizable fighter force. Now, with the Inskip report and with the derivation of radar, now for the first time we had something that would mean that the bomber couldn't always get through. The bomber now was going to be attacked and attacked successfully because now we could concentrate our fighter force on the bombers in time and in space. And this was therefore going to mean that if anyone was going to conduct a bomber attack on the United Kingdom, the level of attrition they would suffer would be unsustainable. Orders were to be concentrated on a few types such as R.J. Mitchell's Spitfire. This was the aircraft that had developed from the successes achieved at the Schneider Trophy. It was to become the most famous aircraft in the RAF's history and 44 different versions would be produced. Well, I first flew a Spitfire in November 1939. I'd heard so much about it that I knew it was going to be an exceptional aircraft. But um, I'd flown most of the low-wing monoplanes at that time. But the uh, Spitfire was unique. It was unique because most low-wing monoplanes uh, behave perfectly in the air. But many of the low-wing monoplanes, when you came into land, depending on your load configuration, would be a little bit tricky on the actual touchdown. But the uh, Spitfire, by virtue of its wing, the little twist in the wing, the flow over the empennage, you could load that under, you could land that under any conditions with a high angle of attack for a three-point landing. No, the first time I flew the, uh, the Spitfire, to me it was straight away, it's a thoroughbred. The RAF was finally modernizing for war. There were dangers in rearming too quickly. Uh, and one can look at what the Italians did in the early 30s. Uh, Mussolini wanted to have a modern air force, and indeed in the early 30s bought himself a modern air force, with the unfortunate consequence that by the start of the Second World War, they were largely out of date. So timing was everything. One needed to develop the right sort of aircraft to be at the point when, when the war started, we had the most modern systems available to us. Now, in that sense, we probably got it right. This expansion required a new structure for the RAF, one which took aircraft types and their roles into consideration. Therefore, bomber, fighter, and coastal commands were created. A new training command was also set up to cope with the huge influx of new recruits. In the years from 1936 until the outbreak of war, Thousands of young men went through their formal training, learning all the skills they would need to become officers in the service. 
the great day would come when they were allowed to take their first solo flight in the Avro Tutor, the aircraft that had become the standard basic trainer in 1933. If all went well, they could expect to receive their wings and become a fully-fledged RAF officer. Solo. Good luck. Solo? Did he really say solo? This is the acid test of his training, confidence, his courage. He's on his own at last. it beautifully, he puts her back on the deck, touching with all three wheels the perfect three-point landing he was hoping to make. Surely he must have passed the test. That's a very good landing indeed. Good show. Thank you, sir. That badge he's worked for and coveted for two years is being sewn on his tunic. He's got his wings. Yes, and not a bad-looking chap either. At the same time, the RAF set up a volunteer reserve, encouraging young men to train as pilots, observers, or wireless operators. Such was the success of the scheme that when the war finally came, more than 10,000 reservists were ready and raring to go. One Sunday morning, I opened the, the paper to see an advert asking for uh, lads of a certain age group to uh, join the volunteer reserve as as uh, sergeants and uh, I applied straight away picked up a pen filled in the form and I was posted to uh, an airfield called uh, Woodley near Red Reading uh, and uh, we would be able to fly there two evenings a week and uh, two weeks a year. And uh, the aircraft that I was trained on was the, the Tiger Moth. I, I managed to assemble about two, 200 hours before uh, we, we received some Hawker Hearts and um, I was uh, horrified by the, the size of the Hawker Heart compared with the with the Tiger Moth and thought I would never be able to fly that but uh, my experience since then has been that uh, one adjusts very quickly to uh, size when aircraft are where aircraft are concerned. Um, this huge aeroplane, the, the uh, Hawker Hart, I realized after a while when I was flying Boeing 707s that I could have stood one of the hearts on each side of the tailplane, which gives you some idea of the scale. Between 1934 and late 1939, the personnel strength more than tripled. The number of operational aircraft quadrupled to over 3,200, and the number of airfields rose from 52 to 89. Hand in hand with this development, 
went the creation of a home defense network. Air Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding had been head of fighter command since its creation in 1936. As such, he was presiding over the start of an entirely new concept in air defense. The latest radio direction finding technology, radar, as it would later become known, would provide group and sector stations with as much detailed warning of bomber attack as possible, and, it was hoped, give the squadrons enough time to scramble and intercept incoming bombers before they reach their targets. And more important than the invention of radar, because let's not forget the Germans were developing radar at the same sort of time, was the ability to tie the radar together into an integrated air defense system, by which we could therefore take an input from a radar station on the south coast, bring it together with all the other radar inputs, and make an overall picture of how the battle was developing. That meant for the first time that the vastness of space now was suddenly being shrunk. And so for the first time, fighter aircraft could now be vectored in to attack bomber forces. The Spitfire, ordered in 1936, didn't get into RAF hands for two years. Basic production problems were mainly to blame. Supermarine had been building aircraft for many years, but only in wood. Working with metal proved to be a very different and difficult task. Both Supermarine and their subcontractors were accustomed to building small quantities of aircraft at a time. Now, mass production called on them to learn new skills and disciplines, something which would hit many aircraft manufacturers before the end of the war. But the years of frantic activity were now beginning to pay off. Finally, the new fighters and bombers began to arrive. By the outbreak of war, a total of nine squadrons were equipped with Spitfires. The Hurricane had arrived the previous year and made up a further 15 squadrons. factories were working at full speed. No one was sure whether they could produce enough aircraft in the time that was left. But very soon they would know for certain. The rest would be up to the RAF. <laughs> 